Good evening, good evening, and welcome to our weekly worship service. And my friends, this evening, you know, we're going to start our new message series, right? And our new message series is called Christ, Our Purpose. And we're taking the next six weeks to look at our vision, mission, and statement of faith to see what God's word has to tell us about our purpose as a church. And today's message is on calling people to Christ. And we will look at several passages of scripture, but we begin with these verses in the Gospel of Matthew. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to look at verses 18 to 20. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. My friends, this evening, I just want to ask you a few questions. Why do we have church? What is the purpose of the church? What are we all doing here? Until you can answer those questions as a church, it is difficult to know what you're supposed to be doing. I once read about a church that started serving weekly dinners in order to reach out to the community. The dinners became so popular, they started serving them more frequently. Eventually, they were doing so well with the dinners, they just shut down the church and became a restaurant in the, instead. Now, that is an example of a church that lost sight of its purpose. I don't think we as a church and ministry are in any danger of shutting our doors and becoming a restaurant. But unless we have a clear understanding of our church's purpose, we can easily become distracted or discouraged. And this can happen with us as individuals, as well as with the church. When you forget why you are part of the church, it is easy for you to lose interest in church. And that is when you need to get back to basics. Why do we have church in the first place? One thing that most churches and businesses do to make sure they keep on track is that they have a purpose statement. In some places, they call it the purpose statement. In other places, it's called the vision and the mission. And these statements normally or usually answers these important questions. Why are we here and what are we supposed to be doing? For example, the purpose statement for Disney is we create happiness by providing the finest in entertainment for people of all ages everywhere. The purpose statement for McDonald's is McDonald's brand mission is to be our customer's favorite place and way to eat and drink. Some com companies include God in their purpose statements. So what is the purpose statement or what is a purpose statement? A purpose statement not only tells you and others why you exist, but it is also important for planning and evaluation. For example, going back to McDonald's purpose statement, McDonald's brand mission is to be our customer's favorite place and way to eat and drink. McDonald's evaluates everything it does by that statement. When they are planning a new product, they run it by their purpose statement. When they evaluate older products, they run it by their purpose statement. My friends, churches need to do the same thing with their purpose statements. They need to plan and evaluate all their ministries and activities according to their purpose statement. Churches also need to make sure that their 
purpose statement has two important qualities, that it is biblical and it is balanced. A church purpose statement needs to be biblical because we want to make sure we are fulfilling God's purposes for the church and not ours. And a church statement needs to be balanced because God tells us that he has several purposes for the church and we want to make sure we are fulfilling each of them. In our church and ministry, we don't call it purpose statement, but the church's purpose statement is embedded in our church vision and mission. And I want to just stop here for a while because I want to share with you the mission, the vision, the mission and the statement of faith of our church and ministry. And this will show you why we are, what, what we stand for, where we are and where we are going to go forward to. So if you just uh, bear with me, I'm going to share screen. All right. Now, if you look here, this is our purpose statement, our vision. Our vision is to establish an apostolic, prophetic, and Bible teaching group of churches that passionately embraces and applies the principles and power of the early church. We envision a community of believers who are deeply rooted in the word of God, led by the Holy Spirit, and equipped to advance the kingdom of God in their local communities and beyond. Through apostolic and prophetic ministry, we seek to ignite a revival of faith, activate spiritual gifts, and empower believers to boldly proclaim the gospel with signs, wonders, and demonstration of God's love. The key elements of our vision, firstly, is the apostolic foundation. The vision emphasizes the importance of establishing a foundation rooted in apostolic principles. This involves modeling the New Testament pattern of church leadership, governance, and functioning. It includes nurturing a culture of servant leadership, apostolic authority, and apostolic missions with a focus on establishing and strengthening churches. Next, we have the prophetic ministry. Our vision also recognizes the significance of the prophetic ministry in the church. It seeks to cultivate an environment where the prophetic gifts are honored, developed, and utilized for the edification, encouragement, and direction of the body of Christ. And this involves fostering a sensitivity to the voice of God and a commitment to living in alignment with God's purposes. The vision calls also for a passionate faith that is characterized by a vibrant and intimate relationship with God. It envisions a community of believers who are fervently pursuing God's presence, hungering for his word and experiencing the fullness of his love and power. And this passion for God fuels a zeal for evangelism, discipleship, and acts of compassion. The next key element is that the vision also recognizes the essential role of the Holy Spirit in empowering believers for effective ministry. It seeks to create an environment where the Holy Spirit is welcomed, honored, and allowed to move freely. This includes cultivating a culture of spiritual gifts, supernatural manifestations, and reliance on the Holy Spirit's guidance and empowerment. The next key element is kingdom advancement. The vision, sorry. The vision is centered on advancing the kingdom of God. It envisions a group of churches that actively engage in evangelism, disciple making, and acts of justice and compassion. And the focus is on impacting local communities 
and extending the reach of the gospel to the nations with a desire to see lives transformed, communities restored, and God's glory revealed. The final key element for our vision is this. The vision embraces the expectation of signs, wonders, and the demonstration of God's love. Our vision recognizes that these supernatural manifestations are not just for personal edification, but also serve as a testimony to the reality of the power and power of God. This includes healing the sick, setting captives free, and demonstrating God's love in tangible ways. By pursuing this vision, an apostolic, prophetic, and Bible teaching group of churches can create a vibrant and empowered community of believers who are deeply rooted in God's word, activated and empowered, uh, uh, activated in their spiritual gifts, equipped to impact the world with the transformative power of the gospel. So my friends, that is our vision. For the mission, our mission as an apostolic, prophetic, and Bible teaching group of churches and Bible college is to equip, train, and empower individuals to become effective leaders, effective ministers, and disciples of Jesus Christ. Through comprehensive biblical education, practical ministry training, and spiritual impartation, we aim to establish a strong foundation for lifelong learning, servant leadership, and impactful ministry locally and internationally. And some of the key elements of our vision is this. Number one is equipping and training. The mission emphasizes the importance of equipping and training individuals to fulfill their God-given callings and serve effectively in ministry. This involves providing comprehensive biblical education, theological training, and practical ministry skills development. The aim is to equip individuals with a solid foundation in the word of God and practical ministry tools. The next key element of our mission is to empower leaders and ministers. This mission seeks to empower individuals to become effective leaders and ministers within the church and society. This includes cultivating leadership qualities, fostering a heart of servanthood and developing skills in areas such as preaching, teaching, pastoral care, evangelism, and discipleship. The focus is on raising up leaders and ministers who, exib who exhibit character, competence, and a deep reliance on the Holy Spirit through fasting, prayer, and worship. The next key element of our mission is church and Bible college partnerships. The, this mission or this element in our mission highlights the partnership between the group of churches and Bible colleges. This collaboration allows for the integration of academic and practical training within a vibrant church community. The church and Bible college serve as a hub for theological education, ministry mentorship, spiritual impartation, ensuring a well-rounded training experience. Another key element of, me, of our mission is lifelong learning, right? This mission recognizes that the process of learning and growth is ongoing. It emphasizes the importance of fostering a culture of lifelong learning, where individuals are encouraged to pursue continuous growth in their knowledge of God's word, theology, ministry skills, and personal development. The goal is to instill a hunger for learning and a commitment to ongoing education throughout the journey of faith. The next key element of our mission is servant leadership. The mission, this key element promotes a model of leadership rooted in servant heartedness. It seeks to develop leaders who lead by example, serving others with humility, with compassion, and a genuine desire to see people grow in their relationship with God. Servant leadership is viewed as essential for effective ministry and influencing positive change in communities and nations. The next key element is impactful ministry, locally and internationally. 
The mission aims to equip individuals to make a significant impact both locally and internationally. It recognizes the importance of engaging with local communities, addressing social needs, and being a witness for Christ. Additionally, it encourages individuals to participate in global missions, cross-cultural ministry, and partnerships with churches and organizations worldwide. And the final uh, uh, key element of our mission is that this mission acknowledges the need for spiritual impartation and activation of spiritual gifts. It seeks to create an environment where individuals encounter the presence of the Holy Spirit, experiencing personal transformation and empowerment for ministry. Spiritual impartation is seen as a catalyst for effective ministry and a deeper intimacy with God. And by faithfully pursuing this mission, an apostolic, prophetic, and Bible teaching group of local and international churches and Bible colleges such as ours can effectively equip, train, and empower individuals to become strong leaders, ministers, and disciples who impact their local communities and the nations with the transformative power of the gospel. That is our missions. Next, my friends, is our statement of faith. Now, I'm taking some time to explain these things because, or to share these pointers with you, because some of us are new and we might not know what the church stands for. And this is important. So just bear with me for a few minutes. Now, our statement of faith goes as follows. Number one, we believe in one true God, eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's the creator of all things, perfect in holiness, love, and wisdom. We believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, his virgin birth, sinless life, sacrificial death on the cross, bodily resurrection, ascension to heaven, and his imminent return in power and glory. We believe in the Holy Spirit who convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit indwells, empowers, and gives believers for effective ministry and it enables them to live a godly life. Next, we believe in the authority and inspiration of the Holy Scriptures, the Old and New Testaments as the Word of God. The Bible is infallible, inerrant, and our ultimate guide for faith, doctrine, and Christian living. Next, we believe in the fallen state of humanity as a result of sin, and the need for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and not by our own works. Next, we believe in the importance of water baptism as an outward expression of faith and identification with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Baptism is an act of obedience and a public declaration of one's faith in Jesus. We believe in the regular observance of the Lord's Supper as a memorial of Christ's sacrificial death, a time of reflection and a celebration of his coming again. Next, we believe in the priesthood of all believers, where every believer has direct access to God through Jesus Christ and is called to serve and minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. Next, we believe in the ministry of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, the edification of the body of Christ, and the advancement of God's kingdom. We believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, including prophecy, healing, miracles, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. These gifts are given for the building of the church and the effective proclamation of the gospel. We believe in the importance of discipleship, nurturing believers in their faith and equipping them to fulfill their God-given purposes and ministry. We believe in the mandate of the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations, proclaiming the gospel, baptizing believers, and teaching them to obey all that Jesus commanded. We believe in the resurrection of the dead, the final judgment, and the eternal reward of, righteous, of the righteous in heaven, and the eternal punishment of the wicked in hell. We believe in the unity of the body of Christ, the universal church, and the call to love and serve one another 
embracing diversity and fostering unity in the spirit. My dear friends, this statement of faith serves as a foundation for Shekinah Grace Church in partnership with our local and international church and Bible college. It guides our beliefs, our teachings and practices and forms the basis for our unity and fellowship as we seek to advance the kingdom of God and fulfill his purposes in the world. So with that, my friends, that basically shows us uh, our statement of purpose. I just shared with you uh, the vision, the mission, the statement of faith. And you will notice that our vision, mission, and statement of faith is both biblical and it is balanced. And these all come directly from the Bible. And, and it seeks to reflect the variety of things that a biblical church should be doing. Now remember, my friends, Christ is our purpose. Our desire is to put Christ at the center of every activity, of every program we do as a church. And we do that by making sure that everything we do lines up with God's purposes for the church as revealed in scripture. This evening, we're going to look at one of the key elements in our, in our vision, mission, and statement of faith. The purpose of Shekinah Grace Church is to make disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ by impactful ministry locally and internationally. So how do we do that? We do that by calling people to Christ. And today I want you to look, or I want us to look at three things that God tells us that we must be doing if we are to call people to Christ. First of all, God calls us to share the gospel with others. The word gospel means good news. We have a message to share with the world, and that message is good news. It is the most wonderful news in the whole world. God sent his son into the world to die for your sins and bring you back to himself. Your sins can be forgiven. Your slate wiped clean. You can begin again with God. The gospel is not simply good history or good information. It is good news and good news is meant to be shared. Did you know that Jesus' first and last commands to his disciples both have to do with sharing the gospel with others. When Jesus saw Andrew and Peter casting a net into the lake, he told them, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. That is found in Matthew 4, verse 19. That was his first command. And Jesus rose from the dead and was ready to go back to heaven. He gave the disciples his last command. Many of us know that it's called the Great Commission, which we find in Matthew 28. And in specifically in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 19, Jesus says this. This is what scripture says. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. What were Jesus' first and last commands to his disciples? Go and share the gospel. Go and share the good news with others. Jesus began the Great Commission by saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That is the basis for the Great Commission. All authority has been given to Jesus. In Psalm verse 2, sorry, Psalm chapter 2, verses 7 to 8, we read this prophetic word from God the Father to his Son. Here's what Psalm 2, verse 7 to 8 says You are my Son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the, the ends of the earth your possession. So when Jesus completed his mission on earth by dying on the cross and by rising to life again, the words of the Psalms were fulfilled. God gave Jesus all authority in heaven and on earth. Jesus has authority everywhere. He is not just the savior of a few, 
or the savior for a certain group of people. He is the savior of the whole world. That does not mean that the whole world will be saved, but rather those in the world who will be saved must come to God through Jesus. In the Great Commission, Jesus declares his authority over all things, and then he, he commands us to go and share the good news with others. Let's look at Matthew 28. Let's look at verses 19 to 20 again. Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20. Here's what scripture says. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. My friends, what I'm trying to tell you this evening is that this is not an option for us as believers. This is not an elective for us as a church. We must go. We must share the good news with others. Jesus' first and last commands both had to do with sharing the gospel. All authority has been given to Jesus and Jesus commands us to go. The second point I want to make is to tell people or telling about Christ's death and resurrection. So, so what do you tell people when you go to them and share the gospel? Do you simply tell them that God loves them and that he wants to forgive them? Do you tell them what a difference God can make in their lives? Do you tell them that God has a purpose and a plan for their lives? Those are all good things to share. But that is not what we mean by sharing the gospel. You can share all those things and more, but there are two specific things that you must communicate if you are truly going to share the gospel with others. And that is, you must tell them about Christ's death and resurrection. His death and resurrection. The Bible tells us that the gospel has specific content. It is not just a general good news that God loves you, but there is specific content in the gospel to hold on to and believe. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 to 2. The apostle Paul writes this, Now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Paul is saying that the gospel or the good news that he preached had specific content. He preached it. The Corinthians received it and took their stand on it. Paul says that it is by this gospel that you are saved. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. If you change the content of the gospel, it no longer has saving power. It, no longer, it is no longer the gospel of Christ. So what is the specific content of the gospel? What is the good news that we are supposed to be sharing with others? Paul tells us in the, text, in the next couple of verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now let's look at verses 3 to 4. Here's what he says. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. In other words, Christ's death and resurrection are absolutely central to the gospel. This is what is of first importance. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christ was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. Notice that Christ did not simply die. He died for our sins. That means he took our place. Jesus never sinned. We were the ones who sinned. We were the ones who deserved God's punishment. And Jesus took that punishment for us at the cross. But Paul even says more. Christ not only died for our sins, he died for our sins according to the scriptures. That means this was not some strange accident or twist of faith. This was God's plan all along. The Old Testament scriptures foretold what Christ would do for us. We read in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 verses 5 to 6. 
Here's what the Bible says. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us, that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So that's the first thing we do when we when, when sharing the gospel with others. We tell them that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, according to God's plan. But then we must also share about Christ's resurrection. Yes, Jesus died for our sins, but he also rose again. Jesus died for your sins. That's good news. Jesus rose from the grave. That's really good news. Or that's the really good news part. Jesus is alive. Jesus has conquered, conquered sin and death and the grave. When you put your faith in Christ, your sins are forgiven and you're given the free gift of eternal life. We do not serve the memory of a religious leader who died centuries ago. We serve the risen Christ who gives us life, who gives us relationship with God every day. Remember, my friends, we are calling people to Christ, not just to Christianity or to the church, but to a person, the person of Jesus Christ, who is alive today. We are calling people to Christ, and that makes all the difference. So yes, you can tell people about God and the church and all sorts of things relating to Christ. But if you're truly going to share the gospel, you must tell them about Christ's death and resurrection. That is what is of first importance. Let me uh, read 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1 to 2 again. Paul said, it is by this gospel that you are saved if you hold firmly to the word preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. So, to whom do we share this amazing news of Jesus' death and resurrection? The short answer is, with anyone who does not know it. Now, I love to hear the gospel over and over again. I never get tired thinking about what Jesus has done for me. In fact, we should all reflect on Christ and the gospel every day. The gospel is the very basis of our Christian walk and faith. But if we only share the gospel with ourselves, if we only share the gospel within the church, then something is terribly wrong with that picture. It's like a group of cancer patients finding a cure and then keeping it to themselves. That would not only be incredibly selfish, it would be morally wrong. And we are dealing with something far more serious than cancer. Cancer only affects a certain percentage of the population. Sin affects us all. Cancer can only kill your body. Sin will kill your body and your soul. We have a responsibility to share the good news with all those who have not heard it. Before Jesus returned to heaven, he told his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts 1 verse 8 says that. So if you look at those place names on a map, you will see a progression. Jerusalem is at the center. That's where the gospel started. Next, the gospel was to go out to the surrounding areas of Judea and Samaria. And then finally, the gospel was to go out to the rest of the world, to the very ends of the earth. So there was both a local component to sharing the gospel as well as a worldwide trust. The same twofold responsibility rests on us as believers today. We should be sharing the gospel locally within our own neighborhoods and communities, and we should also be involved in the worldwide spread of the gospel, especially among people who have no Christian witness or who have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. We need to be doing both, both are an essential part of sharing the gospel with the world. 
Now, you would think that as Christians who have been given the good news of the gospel, we would all be sharing the gospel with people around us all the time. But sadly, that is not the case. So why is that? Why don't we share the gospel more frequently? Hugh, Hugh Chapman, a, the pastor at All Souls Church in England, where John Stott used to pastor, once answered this question at a conference. Let me tell you up front, you're not going to like his answer. That doesn't mean it's not a good answer or that it isn't true. It just means you aren't going to like it. Now, here's what he says. He said, Palmer said that we don't tell people the gospel for one of two reasons. Either because we don't believe the gospel or because we don't love them. And he said that he still struggles with evangelism and he's looking for a third option, but he can't find one. The reason, my friends and family, we do not share the gospel with people is either because deep down in our hearts we don't really believe it, or we do not love people enough to tell them. Now that's a tough answer to solo. But I believe it, it is right. It's like a, our church sign that says, out front this evening, right? We go to some churches and I remember reading this signboard uh, in one of the churches that I visited recently. Friends don't let friends die without Jesus. Friends don't let friends die without Jesus. We sometimes offer other reasons or perhaps excuses, but it all comes back to these two. If we really believe the gospel and we really love the people around us, then we will tell them what God has done for them through Christ. And if we really believe that Jesus is the savior of the whole world, then we will be committed to world missions. We will be praying for missions. We will be giving to missions. We'll be, we'll be in a place where we are, we are willing to go with the gospel ourselves, should God call us. So in conclusion, my friends, what is the purpose of Shekinah Grace Church? Why are we here? The purpose of Shekinah Grace Church is to make disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we do that first of all by calling people to Christ. Now there's more to discipleship than just coming to Christ. But that is where we start. If we're going to fulfill God's purposes for us as a church, we must call people to Christ. If we're not calling people to Christ, then we're not fulfilling God's purpose for us as a church. You might ask, but what do I tell them? If this is an area of struggle for you, I would encourage you to take one of our evangelism training classes. But it's really not that difficult. Tell them God loves them. Tell them that God loves them so much that he gave his only son for them. Tell them Jesus died for their sin and rose again from the grave. Tell them Jesus is alive today and offers them forgiveness for their sins and the free gift of eternal life. That's all. That's what we do. And that's what you can do too. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, as we reflect on the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, we are filled with a renewed sense of purpose and mission. Lord, we are in awe of the authority that has been given to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that all power and authority in heaven and on earth belong to him. Father, with this assurance, we commit ourselves to the task of making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the triune God and teaching them to obey all that you have commanded. Help us to go forth with boldness, knowing that you're always with us, even to the end of the age. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may be empowered to be your witnesses, sharing the good news of salvation and the transforming power of your love. Lord, may our lives be a living testimony to the world. 
as we strive to live in accordance with your will and bring glory to your name. We offer ourselves to you, our gracious and sovereign God, that your kingdom may come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. To our dear friends on social media, on Facebook and YouTube, we thank you for joining us this evening. God bless you all. We'll see you all next week. For those in our household and on Zoom, please hold on and we'll continue with the next uh, program in our worship service. God bless you.